Women Who Run With The Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Chapter 6. Finding One's Pack, Belonging is Blessing. The Ugly Duckling. Sometimes life goes wrong for the wildish woman, from the beginning. Many women had parents who surveyed them as children and puzzled over how the small alien had managed to infiltrate the family. Other parents were always looking heavenward, ignoring or abusing the child, or giving her the old icicle eye. Let women who have had this experience take heart. You've avenged yourself by having been, through no fault of your own, a handful to raise, and an eternal thorn in their sights. And perhaps even today you are able to inspire them to abject fear when you come a-knocking. That's not too shabby as innocent retribution goes. See to it now that you spend less time on what they didn't give you, and more time on finding the people you belong to. You may not belong to your original family at all. You may match your family genetically, but temperamentally you may belong to another group of people. Or you may belong to your family perfunctorily, while your soul leaps out, runs down the road, and is gluttonously happy munching spiritual cookies somewhere else. Hans Christian Andersen wrote dozens of literary stories about children who were orphans, he was a premier advocate of the lost and neglected child, and he strongly supported searching for and finding one's own kind. His rendering of The Ugly Duckling was first published in 1845. The ancient motif underlying the tale is about the unusual and the dispossessed, a perfect wild woman, demi-history. For the last two centuries, The Ugly Duckling has been one of the few stories to encourage successive generations of outsiders to hold on till they find their own. It is what I would call a psychological and spiritual root story. A root story is one that contains a truth so fundamental to human development that without integration of this fact, further progression is shaky and one cannot entirely prosper psychologically until this point is realized. So here is the ugly duckling that I wrote as a literary story based on the eccentric version originally told in the Magyar language by the Felucia's Masaluk rustic tellers from my family. The Ugly Duckling It was near the time of harvest. The old women were making green dolls from corn sheaves. The old men were mending the blankets. The girls were embroidering their white dresses with blood-red flowers. The boys were singing as they pitched golden hay. The women were knitting scratchy shirts for the coming winter. The men were helping to pick and pull and cut and hoe the fruits the fields had brought forth. The wind was just beginning to loosen the leaves a little more, and then a little more each day, and down by the river there was a mother duck brooding on her nest of eggs. Everything was going as it should for this mother duck, and finally one by one her eggs began to tremble and shake until the shells cracked and out staggered all her new ducklings. But there was one egg left, a very big egg, just sat there like a stone. An old duck came by, and the duck mother showed off her new children. Aren't they good looking? she bragged. But the unhatched egg caught the old duck's attention, and she tried to dissuade the duck mother from sitting on that egg any longer. It's a turkey egg, exclaimed the old duck. Not a proper kind of egg at all. Can't get a turkey into the water, you know. She knew, for she had tried. But the duck mother felt that she had been sitting for such a long time, a little longer would not hurt. I'm not worried about that, she said. But do you know that scoundrel father of these ducklings hasn't come to visit me once? But eventually the big egg began to shudder and roll. It finally broke open and out tumbled a big, ungainly creature. His skin was etched with curly red and blue veins. His feet were pale purple, his eyes transparent pink. The duck mother cocked her head and stretched her neck and peered at him. She couldn't help herself. She pronounced him ugly. Maybe it is a turkey after all, she worried. But when the ugly duckling took to the water with the other offspring, the duck mother saw that he swam straight and true. Yes, he's one of my own, even though he's very peculiar in appearance. But actually, in the right light, he's almost handsome. So she presented him to the other creatures in the farmyard. But before she knew it, another duck shot across the courtyard and bit the ugly duckling right in the neck. The duck mother cried, stop, but the bully sputtered. Well, he looks so strange and ugly. He needs to be pushed around. The queen duck with the red rag on her leg said, oh, another brood. 
as though we don't have enough mouths to feed. And that one over there, that big ugly one, well, surely he was a mistake. He's not a mistake, said the duck mother. He's going to be very strong. He just laid an egg too long and is yet a little mishap. He'll straighten out, though, you'll see. She groomed the ugly duckling's feathers and licked his cowlicks. But the others did all they could to harass the ugly duckling. They flew at him, bit him, pecked him, hissed and screeched at him, and their torment of him grew worse as time went on. He hid, he dodged, he zigzagged left and right, but he could not escape. The duckling was as miserable as any creature could be. At first his mother defended him, but then even she grew tired of it all and exclaimed in exasperation, I wish you would just go away. And so the ugly duckling ran away, with most of his feathers pulled out and looking extremely bedraggled. He ran and ran until he reached a marsh. There he lay down at the water's edge with his neck stretched out and sipped as he could from the water now and then. From the rushes two ganders watched him. They were young and full of themselves. Say there, you ugly thing, they sniggered. Want to come with us over to the next county? There's a gaggle of young unmarried geese over there, just right for the choosing. Suddenly shots rang out and the ganders fell with a thud and the marsh water ran red with their blood. The ugly duckling dived for cover and all around were shots and smokes and dog barking. At last the marsh became quiet and the duckling ran and flew as far away as he could. Toward nightfall he, be he came to a poor hovel. The door was hanging by a thread. There were more cracks than walls. Here lived an old raggedy woman with her uncombed cat and her cross-eyed hen. The cat earned her keep with the old woman by catching mice. The hen earned her keep by laying eggs. The old woman felt lucky to have found a duck. Maybe it will lay eggs, she thought, and if not, we can kill it and eat it. So the duck stayed, but he was tormented by the cat and hen, who asked him, What good are you if you cannot lay and you cannot catch? What I like best, sighed the duckling, is to be under, whether it is under the wide blue sky or under the cool blue water. The cat could make no sense of being under water and criticised the duckling for his stupid dreams. The hen could make no sense of getting her feathers all wet, and she made fun of the duckling too. In the end, it was clear that there would be no peace for the, ugly, for the duckling there, so he left to see if things would be better down the road. He came upon a pond, and as he swam there, it became colder and colder. A flock of creatures flew overhead, the most beautiful he had ever seen. They cried down to him, and hearing their sounds made his heart leap and break at the same time. He cried back in a sound he had never made before. He had never seen creatures more beautiful than they. He had never felt more bereft. He turned and turned in the water to watch them till they flew out of sight. Then he dove to the bottom of the lake and huddled there, trembling. He was beside himself, for he felt a desperate love for those great white birds, a love he could not understand. The colder wind began and blew harder and harder through the days, and snow came upon frost. The old men broke the ice and the milk pails, and the old woman spun long into the night. The mothers fed three miles at once by candlelight, and the men searched for the sheep under white skies at midnight. The young men went waist deep in the snow to go milking, and the girls imagined they saw faces of handsome young men in the flames of the fire while they cooked. And down at the pond nearby, the duckling had to swim faster and faster in circles to keep a place for himself in the ice. One morning the duckling found himself frozen in the ice. It was then that he felt he would die. Two mallards flew down and skidded onto the ice. They surveyed the duck. You are ugly, they barked. Too bad, so sad. Nothing can be done for such as you. And off they flew. Luckily a farmer came by and freed the duckling by breaking the ice with his staff. He lifted the duckling up and tucked him under his coat and marched him home. In the farmer's house the children reached for the duckling, but he was afraid. He flew up to the rafters, making all the dust fall down into the butter. From there he dove into the milk pitcher, and as he struggled out, all wet and woozy, he fell over into the flour barrel. The farmer's wife chased him with her broom. The children screamed with laughter. The duckling flapped through the cat's door, and outside at last lay in the snow, half dead. From there he struggled on till he came to another pond, then another house, another pond, another house. The entire winter was spent this way, alternating between life and death.
and even so the gentle breath of spring came, and the old woman shook out the feather beds, and old men put away their long underwear. New babies came into the, in the night, while fathers paced the yard under starry skies. During daylight, like the young girls put daffodils in their hair, and young men studied girls' ankles. And on a pond nearby, the water became warmer, and the ugly duckling who floated there stretched his wings. How strong and big his wings were! They lifted him high over the land. From the air he saw the orchids in the white gowns. The farmers ploughing, the young of all nature hatching, tumbling, buzzing and swimming. Also paddling on the pond were three swans, the same beautiful creatures he had seen the autumn before. Those that so caused his heart to ache, he felt pulled to join them. What if they act as though they like me? And then just as I join them, they fly away laughing, thought the duckling. But he glided down and landed on the pond, his heart beating hard. As soon as they saw him, the swans began to swim towards him. No doubt I am about to meet my end, thought the duckling. But if I am to be killed, then rather by these beautiful creatures than by hunters, farm wives, or long winters. And he bowed his head to await the blows. But la, in the reflection in the water, he saw a swan in full dress. Snowy plumage, slow eyes and all. The ugly duckling did not at first recognize himself, for he looked just like the beautiful strangers, just like those he had admired from afar. And it turned out that he was one of them after all. His egg had accidentally rolled into a family of ducks. He was a swan, a glorious swan. And for the first time, his own kind came near him and touched him gently and lovingly with their wingtips. They groomed him with their beaks and swam around and round him in greeting. And the children who came to feed the swans bits of bread cried out, There's a new one! And as children everywhere do, they ran to tell everyone. And the old woman came down to the water and braiding their long silver hair. And the young men cupped the deep green water in their hands and flicked it at the young girls who blushed like petals. The men took time away from milking just to breathe the air. The women took time away from mending just to laugh with their mates. And the old men told stories about how war is too long and life too short. And one by one, because of life and passion and time passing, they all danced away. The young men, the young women, all danced away. And the old ones, the husbands, the wives, they all danced away. The children and the swans all danced away, leaving just us and the springtime. And down by the river, another mother duck begins to brood on her nest of eggs. The problem of the exiled one is primeval. Many fairy tales and myths centre around the theme of the outcast. In such tales, the central figure is tortured by events outside her venue, often due to a poignant oversight. In The Sleeping Beauty, the 13th fairy is overlooked and not invited to the christening, which results in a curse being placed upon the child, effectively exiling everyone in one way or another. Sometimes exile is enforced through sheer meanness as when the stepmother casts her stepdaughter out into the dark wood in Vasilisa the Wise. Other times, exile comes about as a result of naive error. The Greek god Hephaestus took his mother's, his mother's head aside in an argument with Zeus, her husband. Zeus became infuriated and hurled Hephaestus off Mount Olympus, vanishing and crippling him. Sometimes exile comes from a striking a bargain one does not understand, such as in the tale of a man who agrees to wonder as a beast for a certain number of years in order to win some gold, and later discovers he's given his soul to the devil in disguise. The ugly duckling theme is universal. All stories of the exile contain the same nucleus of meaning, but each is surrounded by different frills and furbelows reflecting the cultural background of the story, as well as the poetry of the individual teller. The core meanings we are concerned with are these. The duckling of the story is symbolic of the wild nature, which, when pressed into circumstances of little nurture, instinctively strives to continue no matter what. The wild nature instinctively holds on and holds out, sometimes with style, other times with little grace, but holds on nevertheless. And thank goodness for that. For the wildish woman, duration is one of her greatest strengths. The other important aspect of the story is that when an individual's particular kind of soulfulness which is both an instinctual and a spiritual identity, is surrounded by psychic acknowledgement and acceptance. That person feels life and power as never before. Ascertaining one's own psychic family brings a person vitality and belongingness. 
exile of the unmatched child. In the story, the various creatures of the village peer at the ugly duckling and one way or another pronounce him unacceptable. He's not ugly in reality, but he does not match the others. He's so different that he looks like a black bean in a bushel of green peas. The mother duck at first tries to defend this duckling, whom she believes to be her offspring, but finally she is profoundly divided emotionally and withdraws from caring from the alien child. His siblings and others of his community fly at him, peck at him, torment him. They mean to chase him away, and the ugly duckling is heartbroken, really, to be rejected by his own. It's a terrible thing, especially since he really did nothing to warrant it, other than look different and act a little different. If truth be told, we have, but we have here, before the creature is even half-grown, a duckling with massive psychological complex. Girl children who display a strong instinctive nature often experience significant suffering in early life. From the time their babies are taken captive, domesticated, and told they are wrong-headed and improper, their wildish natures show up early. They're curious, artful, and have gentle eccentricities of various sorts, ones that, if developed, will constitute the basis of their creativity for the rest of their lives. Considering that the creative life is the soul's food and water, this basic development is excruciatingly critical. Generally, early exile begins through no fault of one's own, and is exacerbated by the misunderstanding, the cruelty of ignorance, or through intentional meanness of others. Then the basic self of the psyche is wounded early on. When this happens, a girl begins to believe that the negative images of her family and culture reflect back to her about herself are not only totally true, but are also totally free of bias, opinion, and personal preference. The girl begins to believe that she is weak, ugly, unacceptable, and that this will continue to be true, no matter how hard she tries to reverse it. The girl is banished for the exact reasons we see in the ugly duckling. In many cultures, there is an expectation when the female child is born that she is or will become a certain type of person, acting in a certain time-honored way, that she will have a certain set of values, which if not identical to the family's, then at least based on the family's values, and which at any rate will not rock the boat. These expectations are defined very narrowly when one or both parents suffer from a desire for the angel child that is the perfect conforming child. In some parents' fantasy, whatever child they have will be perfect and will reflect only the parent's ways and means. If the child is wildish, she may unfortunately be subjected to her parents' attempts at psychic surgery over and over again, for they're trying to remake the child and more so trying to change what her soul requires of her. Though her soul requires seeing, the culture around her requires sightlessness. Though her soul wishes to speak its truth, she is pressured to be silent. Neither the child's soul nor her psyche can accommodate this. Pressure to be adequate in whatever manner authority defines it can chase the child away, or underground, or set her to wander for a long time, looking for a place of nourishment and peace. When culture narrowly defines what constitutes success or desirable perfection in anything, looks, height, strength, form, acquisition, power, economics, manliness, womanliness, good children, good behavior, religious belief, then corresponding mandates to measure oneself against these criteria are interjected into the psyches of all the members of that culture. So the issues of the exiled and wildish woman are usually twofold, inner and personal, outer and cultural. Let us attend here to the inner issues of the exile, for when one develops adequate strength, not perfect strength, but moderate and serviceable strength, in being oneself and finding what one belongs to, one can influence the outer community and cultural consciousness in masterful ways. What is moderate strength? It is when the internal mother who mothers you isn't 100% confident about what to do next. 75% confident will do nicely. 75% is a goodly amount. Remember, we say that a flower is blooming, whether it is in half, three quarters, or full bloom. Kinds of mothers. While we can interpret the mother in the story as symbolic of one's external mother, most who are grown up now have, as a legacy from their actual mother, an internal mother. This is an aspect of psyche that acts and responds in a manner identical to a woman's experience in childhood with her own mother. Further, this internal mother is made from not only the experience of the personal mother, but also other mothering figures in our lives, as well as images held out as the good mother and the bad mother in the culture at the time of our childhoods. For most adults, if there was trouble with the mother once, but there is no more, 
There is still a duplicate mother in the psyche who sounds, acts, responds the same as in early childhood. Even though a woman's culture may have evolved into more conscious reasoning about the role of mothers, the internal mother will have the same views and ideas about what a mother should look like, act like, at those in one's childhood's culture. In depth psychology, this entire maze is called the mother complex. It is one of the core aspects of a woman's psyche, and it is important to recognize its condition, strengthening certain aspects writing some, dismantling others, and beginning over again if necessary. The duck mother in the story has several qualities, which we'll analyze one by one. She is representative of, all at the same time, an ambivalent mother, a collapsed mother, an unmothered mother. By examining these mothering structures, we can begin to assess whether our own internal mother complex staunchly sustains our unique qualities, or whether it needs a long overdue adjustment. The ambivalent mother. In our story, the duck mother is cut away, forced away from her instincts. She is taunted for having a child who is different. She is divided emotionally and as a result collapses and withdraws her caring from the alien child. Although initially she tries to stand firm, the duckling's otherness begins to jeopardize the mother's safety in her own community and she tucks her head and dives. Have you not witnessed a mother forced to such a decision? If not fully, then partially, the mother bends to the desires of her village rather than aligning herself with her child. Right into the present, mothers still act out the well-founded fears of centuries of women before them. To be shut out of the community is to be ignored and regarded with suspicion at the least, and to be hunted down and destroyed at the worst. A woman in such environs will often try to mould her daughter so that she acts properly in the outer world, thereby hoping to save her daughter and herself from attack. This is a mother and a child who are then both divided. In the ugly duckling, the duck mother is physically divided, and this causes her to be pulled in several different directions, which is what ambivalence is all about. Any mother who has ever been under fire will recognize her. One pull is her own desire to be accepted by her village, another is for self-preservation. The third pull is to respond to the fear that she and her child will be punished, persecuted, or killed by the village. This fear is normal response to an abnormal threat of psychic or physical violence. The fourth pull is mother's instinctual love for her child and the preservation of that child. It is not uncommon in punitive cultures for women to be torn between being accepted by the ruling class, her village, and loving her child, be it a symbolic child, creative child, or biological child. This is an old, old story. Women have died physically and spiritually for trying to protect the unsanctioned child, whether it be their art, their lover, their politics, their offspring, or their soul life. At the extreme, women have been hanged, burned, and murdered for defying the village prescriptions and sheltering the unsanctioned child. A mother with a child who is different must have the endurance of Sisyphus, the fearsomeness of the Cyclops, and the tough hide of Caliban to go against a mean-spirited culture. The most destructive cultural conditions for women to be born into and to live under are those that insist on obedience without consultation with one's soul, those with no loving forgiveness rituals, those that force a woman to choose between soul and society, those where compassion for others is walled off by economic tears or caste systems, where the body is seen as something needing to be cleaned or as a shrine to be regulated by fiat, where the new, the unusual or the different engenders no delight and where curiosity and creativity are punished and denigrated instead of rewarded, or rewarded only if one is not a woman, where painful acts are perpetrated on the body and called holy, or whenever a woman is punished unjustly, as Alice Miller puts it distinctly, for her own good, where the soul is not recognized as being in its own right. When a woman has this ambivalent mother construct in her own psyche, she may find herself giving in too easily, she may find herself afraid to take a stand, to demand respect, to assert her right to do it, learn it, live it in her own way. Whether these issues derive from an internal construct or an external culture, in order for the mothering function to withstand such constraints, she must have some very fierce qualities, qualities that in many cultures are considered masculine. For generations, sadly, the mother who wanted to engender esteem in herself and her offspring needed the very qualities that were expressly forbidden to her, vehemence, fearlessness, and fearsomeness. For a mother to happily raise a child who is slightly or largely different in psyche and soul, needs from that of the mainstream culture, 
she must have a start on some heroic quality herself she must be able like the heroines of myths to find and obtain these qualities if they're not allowed to shelter them unleash them at the right time and stand for herself and what she believes there's almost no way to make oneself ready for this other than to take a deep draught of courage and then act since time out of mind a considered act of heroism has been the cure for stultifying ambivalence the collapsed mother Finally, the duck mother can no longer stand the harassment of the child she has helped into the world. But what is even more telling is that she can no longer tolerate the torment she herself experiences from her community as she attempts to protect her alien child. So she collapses. She cries to the little duckling, I wish you were far away. And the tortured duckling runs away. When a mother collapses psychologically, it means she has lost her sense of herself she may be a malignantly narcissistic mother who feels entitled to be a child herself. More likely, she has been se severed from the wildish self and has been frightened into collapse by some real threat, psychic or physical. When people collapse, they usually slide into one of three feeling states. A muddle, they're confused. A wallow, they feel no one adequately sympathizes with their travail. Or a pit, an emotional replay of an old wounding often an uncorrected and unaccounted for injustice done to them when they, were, when they themselves were children. The way to cause a mother to collapse is to divide her emotionally. The most common way time out of mind has been to force her to choose between her loving children and fearing what harm the village will visit on her and the child if she does not comply with the rules. In Sophie's Choice by William Styron, the heroine Sophie is a prisoner in a Nazi extermination camp she stands before the Nazi commandant with her two children in her arms. The commandant forces her to choose which of the two children will live and which will die by telling Sophie that if she refuses to make a choice, both children will be killed. While to be forced to make such a choice is unthinkable, it is a psychic choice that mothers have been forced to make for eons. Obey the rules and kill off your children or else. It goes on. When a mother is forced to choose between the child and the culture, there is something abhorrently cruel and unconsidered about that culture. The culture that acquires harm to one's soul in order to follow the culture's prescriptions is a very sick culture indeed. This culture can be the one a woman lives in, but more damning yet, it can be the one she carries around and complies with within her own mind. There are countless literal examples of this throughout the world. Some of the most heinous examples being found in America, where it has been traditional to force women away from their loved ones and from the things they love. There was the long and ugly history of breaking families forced into slavery in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. There is in the last many centuries the prescription that mothers should surrender their sons to the nation for the sake of war and be glad of it. There are the forced repatriations that continue yet today. There have been various fashions at various times throughout the world that prescribe that a woman should not be allowed to love and shelter whoever she loves and in whichever way she wishes. One of the least spoken about oppressions of women's soul lives concerns millions of unmarried mothers or never married mothers throughout the world, including the United States, who in this century alone were pressured by cultural mores to hide their condition or their children or else to kill or surrender their offspring or to live a half-life under assumed identities and as, and as reviled and disempowered citizens. For generations, women accepted the role of legitimizing humans through marriage to a man. They agreed that a human was not acceptable unless a man said so. Without that masculine protection, the mother is vulnerable. It is ironic, then, that in The Ugly Duckling, the father is mentioned only once. That is when the mother duck is brooding on the ugly duckling. She laments about the father of her offspring, that scoundrel hasn't come to visit me once. For a long time in our culture, the father, unfortunately, and for whatever reasons, was unable, unwilling to be there for anyone, most sorely even himself. One could easily say that for many, many wildish girl children, the father was a collapsed man, just a shade who hung himself along with his coat in the closet every night. When a woman has a collapsing mother construct within her psyche and or her old culture, she is wobbly about her worth. 
She may feel that choices between fulfilling outer demands and the demands of soul are life and death issues. She may feel like a tormented outsider who belongs nowhere, which is relatively normal for the exile. But what is not normal is to sit down and cry about it and do nothing. One is supposed to get to one's feet and go off in search of what one, one belongs to. For the exile, that is always the next step. And for a woman with an internalized collapsing mother, it is the quintessential step. If a woman has a collapsing mother, she must refuse to become one to herself also. The child mother or the unmothered mother. The image portrayed by the duck mother in the tale, as we can see, is very unsophisticated and naive. By far, the most common kind of fragile mother is the unmothered mother. In the story, she is so insistent on having babies eventually turns from her child. There are many reasons a human and or psychic mother might act thusly. She may be an unmothered woman herself. She may be one of the fragile mothers, physically very young or very naive. She may be so physically dislocated that she considers herself unlovable, even by a baby. She may have been so tortured by her family and her culture that she cannot imagine herself worthy of touching the hem of the radiant mother archetype that accompanies new motherhood. You see, there are no two ways about it. A mother must be mothered in mothering her own offspring. Though a woman has an inalienable spiritual and physical bond with her offspring, in the world of the instinctual wild woman, she does not just suddenly become a fully formed temporal mother all by herself. In olden times, the blessings of the wildish nature normally came through the hands and words of the woman who nurtured the younger mothers, especially first-time mothers, have within them not an experienced old crone, but a child mother. A child mother can be any age, 18 or 40, doesn't matter. Every new mother begins as a child mother. A child mother is old enough to have babies and has good instincts in the right direction, but she needs the mothering of an older woman or woman who essentially prompt, encourage and support her in the mothering of her children. For eons, this role was served by the older women of the tribe or village. These human goddess mothers, who were later relegated by religious institutions to the role of godmother, constituted an essential female to female nutritional system that nourished the young mothers in particular, teaching them how to nourish the psyches and souls of their young children in return. When the goddess mother role became more intellectualized, the godmother came to mean something or someone who made sure the child did not stray from the precepts of the church. Much was lost in the transmigration. The older women were the arcs of instinctual knowledge and behavior who could invest the young mothers with the same. Women give this knowing to each other through words, but also by other means. Complicated messages about what and how to be are sent simply through a look, a touch with the palm of the hand, a murmur, or a special kind of I cherish you hug. The instinctual self always blesses and helps those who come after. It is this way among healthy creatures and among healthy humans. In this way, the child mother is swept across the threshold into the circle of mature mothers who welcome her with jokes, gifts, and stories. This woman-to-woman -woman circle was once the domain of the wild woman, and it had open membership. Anyone could belong. But we, all we have left of us today is the little tatter called a baby shower, where all the birthing jokes, mother gifts, and genitalia stories are squeezed into two hours' time, no longer available to the woman throughout her entire lifetime as a mother. In most parts of industrialized countries today, the young mother's broods, births, and attempts to benefit her offspring all by herself. It is a tragedy of enormous proportions because many women were born to fragile mothers, child mothers, and unmothered mothers. They may themselves possess a similar internal style of self-mothering. The woman who has a child mother or unmothered mother construct in her psyche or glorified in the culture and maintained at work and in the family is likely to suffer from naive presentiments, lack of seasoning, and in particular a weakened instinctual ability to imagine what will happen one hour, one week, one month, one year, five years, ten years from now. A woman with a child mother within takes on the aura of a child pretending to be a mother. Women in this state often have an un differentiated, long-live-everything attitude, do-everything-be-everything-to-everyone brand of hypermomism. They are not able to guide and support their children, but like the farmer's children in the Aki story, who are so thrilled to have a creature in the house, but do not know how to give it proper care, the child mother winds up leaving the children, child battered and bedraggled. Without realizing it, the child mother tortures her offspring 
with various forms of destructive attention and in some cases lack of useful attention. Sometimes the frail mother is herself a swan who has been raised by ducks. She has not been able to find her true identity soon enough to benefit her offspring. Then, as her daughter comes upon the great mystery of the wildish nature of the feminine in adolescence, the mother too finds herself having sympathy pangs and swan urges. The daughter's search for identity may even inaugurate the mother's maiden journey for the, her lost self at last. So in that household between the mother and the daughter, there will be two wildish spirits down in the basement holding hands, hoping to be called upstairs. So these are the things that can go awry when the mother is cut away from her own instinctive nature, but do not sigh too hard or too long, for there is help for all of this. The strong mother, the strong child. The remedy is in gaining mothering for one's young internal mother. This is gained from actual women in the outer world who are older and wiser and preferably who have been tempered like steel. They are fire-hardened for having gone through what they have gone through. Regardless of the cost, even now, their eyes see, their ears hear, their tongues speak, and they are kind. Even if you've had the most wonderful mother in the world, you may eventually have more than one. As I've often told my own daughters, you are born to one mother, but if you are lucky, you will have more than one, and among them, all you will find most of what you need. Your relationships with todas las madres, the many mothers, will most likely be ongoing ones for the need for guidance and advisory is never outgrown, nor from the point of view of women's deep creative life should it ever be. Relationships between women, whether the women share the same bloodlines or are psychic soulmates, whether the relationship is between analyst and analysant, between teacher and apprentice, or between kindred spirits, are kinship relationships of the most important kind. While some who write in psychology today tout the leaving of the entire mother matrix as though it were a coup, that if not accomplished, taints one forever, and though some may say that denigration of one's personal mother is good for an individual's mental health, in truth, the construct and concept of the wild mother can never and should never be abandoned. For if it is, a woman abandons her deep nature, the one with all the knowing in it, all the bags of seeds, all the thorn needles for mending, all the medicines for work and rest and love and hope. Rather than disengaging from the mother, we are seeking a wild and wise mother. We are not, cannot be separate from her. Our relationship to the soulful mother is meant to turn and turn, to change and change, and it is a paradox. The mother is a school we are born into, a school we are students in, a school we are teachers at, all at the same time and for the rest of our lives. Whether we have children or not, whether we nourish the garden, the sciences, or the thunderworld of poetics, we always brush against the wild mother on our way to anywhere else. And this is as it should be. But what shall we say for the woman who truly has had an experience of destructive mothering in her own childhood? Of course, that time cannot be erased, but it can be eased. It cannot be sweetened up, but it can be rebuilt strongly and properly now. It is not the rebuilding of the internal mother that is so frightening to so many rather the fear that something essential died back then, something that can never be brought back to life, something that received no nourishment, for physically one's own mother was dead herself. For you, I say, be at peace. You're not dead. You're not lethally injured. As in nature, the soul and the spirit have resources that are astonishing. Like wolves and other creatures, the soul and spirit are able to thrive on very little, and sometimes for a long time on nothing. To me, it is the miracle of miracles that this is so. Once I was transplanting a hedge grove lilac. One great bush was dead from a mysterious cause, but the rest was shaggy with purple in springtime. The dead one cracked and crunched like peanut brittle as I dug it out. I found that its root system was attached to all the other living lilacs up and down the fence line. Even more astounding, the dead one was the mother. She had the thickest and oldest roots. All of her big babies were doing fine, even though she herself was botas aribas, boots up, so to speak. Lilacs reproduce with what is called a sucker system, so each tree is a root offshoot of the primal parent. In this system, even if the mother fails, the offspring can survive. This is a psychic pattern promise for those who, with little or no, as well as those who have had torturous mothering. Even though the mother somehow falls over, even though she has nothing to offer, the offspring will develop and grow independently and still thrive. Bad company. 
Ugly duckling goes from pillar to post, trying to find a place to be addressed. While instinct about exactly where to go may not be fully developed, instinct to rove until one finds what one needs is well intact. Yet there is a kind of pathology, sometimes in the ugly duckling syndrome. One keeps knocking at the wrong doors, even after one knows better. It's hard to imagine how a person is supposed to know which doors are right if one has never known a right door to begin with. However, the wrong doors are those that cause you to feel the outcast all over again. This is the looking for love in all the wrong places, response to exile. When a woman turns to repetitive compulsive behavior, repeating over and over again a behavior that is not fulfilling, it causes decline into the same vitality. In order to solve her exile, she's actually causing more damage because the original wounded state is not being attended to, and she incurs new wounding with each foray. This is like putting some puny medicine on your nose when you have a gash in your arm. Different women choose different kinds of wrong medicine. Some choose obviously wrong, such as bad company, overindulgences that are harmful, or soul-stealing, things that first build a woman way up and then tear her down to ground zero, five, minute, minus five. The solutions to these bad choices are several fold. If the woman were able to sit herself down and peer into her own heart, she would see there a need to have her talents, her gifts, and her limitations respectively, respectfully acknowledged and accepted. So to begin healing, stop kidding yourself that a little feel-good of the wrong sort will take care of a broken leg. Tell the truth about your wound, and then you will get a truthful picture of the remedy to apply to it. Don't pack whatever is easiest or most available into the emptiness. Hold out for the right medicine. You will recognize it because it makes your life stronger rather than weaker. Not looking right. Like the ugly duckling, an outsider learns to stay away from situations where one may be able to act right, but still doesn't look right. The duckling, for instance, can swim well, but still doesn't look right. Conversely, a woman may look right, but may not be able to act right. There are many sayings about persons who cannot hide what they are, and in their hearts don't wish to. All the way from East Texan, you can dress them up, but you can't take them out to the Spanish. She was a woman with a black feather under her skirt. In the story, the duckling begins to act like a dumbling, the one who can't do anything right. He flaps dust into the butter and falls into the flour barrel, but not until he has forced, first fallen into the milk pitcher. We all have had times like this. Can't do anything right, try to make it better, make it worse instead. Duckling had no business in that house. But you see what happens when one is desperate. One goes to the wrong place, the wrong thing. As one of my dear late colleagues used to say, you can't get milk at the ram's house. While it is useful to make bridges, even to those groups one does not belong to, and it is important to try to be kind, it is also imperative not to strive too hard, to not believe too deeply that if one acts just right, if one manages to tie down all the itches and twitches of the wildish creatura, that one can actually pass for a nice, restrained, subdued, and demure lady woman. It's that kind of acting, that kind of ego wish to belong at all costs, that knocks out the wild woman connection in the psyche. Then instead of a vital woman, you have a nice woman who is declawed. Then you have a well-behaved, well-meaning, nervous woman, panting to be good. No, it is better, more graceful, and far more soulful to just be what and as you are, and let other creatures be what they are too. Frozen feeling, frozen creativity. Women deal with exile in other ways. Like the duckling who becomes frozen in the ice of the pond, they freeze up. Freezing up is the worst thing a person can do. Coldness is the kiss of death to creativity, relationship, life itself. Some women act as though it is an achievement to be cold. It is not. It is an act of defensive anger. In archetypal psychology, to be cold is to be without feelings. There are stories of the frozen child, the child who could not feel. The corpse is frozen in the ice, during which time nothing could move, nothing could become, nothing could be born. For a human to be frozen means to be purposely without feeling, especially toward oneself, but also and sometimes even more so towards others. While it is a self-protective mechanism, it is hard on the soul psyche, 
The soul does not respond to iciness, but rather warmth. An icy attitude will put out a woman's creative fire. It will inhibit the creative function. This is a serious problem, yet the story gives us an idea. The ice must be broken and the soul taken out of the freeze. When writers, for example, feel dry, dry, they know that the way to become a moist is to write. But if they are locked in ice, they won't write. There are painters who are gasping to paint. They're telling themselves, get out of here. Your work is weirdly strange and ugly. There are many artists who have not yet gotten a good foothold or who are old war horses developing their creative lives. And yet still, every time they reach for the pen, the brush, the ribbons, the script they hear, you're nothing but trouble. Your work is marginal or completely unacceptable because you yourself are marginal and unacceptable. So what is the solution? Do as the duckling does. Go ahead, struggle through it. Pick up the pen already and put it to the page and stop whining. Write, pick up the brush and be mean to yourself for a change. Paint. Dancers, put on the loose chemise. Tie the ribbons in your hair, at your waist, or on your ankles, and tell the body to take it from there. Dance. Actress, playwright, poet, musician, or any other, generally just stop talking. Don't say one more word unless you're a singer. Shut yourself in a room with a ceiling or in a clearing under the sky. Do your art. Generally, a thing cannot freeze if it is moving, so keep moving. The Passing Stranger Although in the story the farmer taking the duck home seems to be a literary device to further the story, rather than an archetypal leitmotif about exile, there is a thought here that I think is valuable. A person who might take us out of the ice, who might even psychically free us from our lack of feeling, is not necessarily going to be the one to whom we belong. It may be, as in the story, another of those magical but fleeting events that again came along when we least expected it, an act of kindness from a passing stranger. This is another example of nourishment of the psyche that occurs when one is at the end of one's rope and cannot stand it any more. Then a something that is sustaining appears out of nowhere to assist you and then disappears into the night, leaving you wondering, was that a person or a spirit? It might be a sudden gust of luck that brings something very needed in through your door. It might be as simple as a thing as a respite, a let up in pressure, a small space of rest and repose. This is not a fairy tale we're talking about now, but real life. Whatever it might be, it is a time when the spirit, in one way or another, feeds us, pulls us out, shows us the secret passage, the hiding place, the escape route. And this coming when we are down and feeling stormy, dark or dark, ca darkly calm, is what pushes us through the channel to the next step, the next phase in learning the strength of exile. Exile as boon. If you have attempted to fit whatever mould and failed to do so, you're probably lucky. You may be an exile of some sort, but you have sheltered your soul. There is an odd phenomenon that occurs when one keeps trying to fit and fails. Even though the outcast is driven away, she is at the same time driven right into the arms of her psychic and true kin. Whether these be a course of study, an art form, or a group of people, it is worse to stay where one does not belong at all than to wander about lost for a while and looking for the psychic and soulful kinship one requires. It is never a mistake to search for what one requires. Never. There is something useful in all this talk and tension. Something in the duckling is being tempered, being made strong by this exile. While the situation is not one we would wish on anyone for any reason, its effect is similar to pure natural carbon under pressure, producing diamonds. It leads eventually to a profound magnitude and clarity of psyche. There is an aspect of alchemy, wherein the base substance of lead is pounded about and beaten down. While exile is not a thing to desire for the fun of it, there is an unexpected gain from it. The gifts of exile are many. It takes out weaknesses by the pounding. It removes whininess, enables acute insight, heightens intuition, grants the power of keen observation and perspective the insider can never achieve. Even though there are negative aspects to it, the wild psyche can endure exile. It makes us yearn that much more to free our own true nature and causes us to long for a culture to match. Even this yearning, this longing, makes a person go on. It makes a woman go on looking. And if she cannot find the culture that encourages her, then she usually decides to construct it herself. And that is good, 
But if she builds it, others who have been looking for a long time will mysteriously arrive one day enthusiastically proclaiming that they have been looking for this all along. The uncombed cats and cross-eyed hens of the world. The uncombed cat and cross-eyed hen find the duckling's aspirations stupid and nonsensical, gives just the right perspective on the touchiness and the values of others who denigrate those who are not like themselves. Who would expect a cat to like the water? Who would expect a hen to go swimming? No one, of course, but too often from the exile's point of view, when people are not alike, it is the exile who is inferior and the limitations and or motives of the other are not properly weighed or evaluated. Well, in the spirit of not wanting to make one person less and another person more, or any more than we have to for the purpose of discussion, let us just say that here the duckling has the same experience that thousands of exiled women have, that of a basic incompatibility with dissimilar persons, which is no one's fault, even though most women are too obliging and take it on as though it is their fault personally. When this happens, we see women who are ready to apologize for taking up space. We see women who are afraid to just say no thank you and leave. We see women who listen to someone telling them that they are wrong-headed over and over again without understanding that cats don't swim and hens don't dive into water. I must admit, I sometimes find it useful in my practice to delineate the various typologies of personality as cats and hens and ducks and swans and so forth. If warranted, I might ask my client to assume for a moment that she's a swan who does not realize it. Assume also for a moment that she has been brought up or is currently surrounded by ducks. There's nothing wrong with ducks, I assure them, or with swans. But ducks are ducks and swans are swans. Sometimes, to make the point, I have to move to another and other animal metaphors. What if you were raised by the mice people? But what if you're, say, a swan? Swans and mice hate each other, each other's food for the most part. They, they each think the other smells funny. They're not interested in spending time together, and if they did, one would be constantly harassing the other. But what if you, being a swan, had to pretend you were a mouse? What if you had to pretend to be grey and furry and tiny? What if you had no long, snaky tail to carry in the air on tail-carrying day? What if, wherever you went, you tried to walk like a mouse, but you waddled instead? What if you tried to talk like a mouse, but instead came out with a honk every time? Wouldn't you be the most miserable creature in the world? The answer is unequivocal yes. So why? If it is also and true, do women keep trying to bend and fold themselves into shapes that are not theirs? I must say, from years of clinical observation of this problem, that most of the time it is not because of deep-seated masochism or a malignant dedication to self-destruction or anything of that nature. More often it is because a woman simply does not know any better. She is unmothered. There is a saying, Tu puedes saber muchas cosas. You can know about things, but it is not the same as sentido, possessing sense. The duckling seems to know things, but he has no sense. He is unmothered, meaning untaught at the most basic level. Remember, it is the mother who teaches by expanding the innate talents of the offspring. Animal mothers who teach their offspring to hunt are not exactly teaching them how to hunt, for that is in their bones already. But they are teaching them to watch out, what to watch out for, what to pay attention to. Those things are not known to them until the mother shows them, thereby activating new learning and innate wisdom. It is the same for women in exile. If she's an ugly duckling, if she's unmothered, the instincts have not been sharpened. She learns instead by trial and error. Usually many trials, many errors, but there is hope for you see the exile never gives up. She keeps going till she finds the guide, the scent, till she finds the trail, till she finds home. Wolves never look more funny than when they have lost their scent and scrabble to find it again. They hop in the air, they run in circles, they plough up the ground with their noses, they scratch the ground, then run ahead, then back, then they stand cock stock still. They look as if they have lost their wits, but what they're really doing is picking up all the clues they can find. They're biting them down out of the air, they are filling up their lungs with smells at ground level and at shoulder level. They are tasting the air to see who has passed through it recently. Their ears are rotating like satellite dishes, picking up transmissions from afar. Once they have all the clues in one place, they know what to do next. Though a woman may look scattered when she has lost touch with the life she values most and is running about trying to recapture it, she is most often gathering information, 
taking a taste of this, grabbing up a paw of that. At the very most, one might briefly explain to her what it is that she is doing. Then let her be. As soon as she processes all information from the clues she's gathered, she'll be moving in an intentional manner again. Then the desire for membership in the uncombed cat and cross-eyed hen club will diminish to nothing. Remembrance and continuance, no matter what. We all have a longing that we feel for our own kind, our wild kind. The duckling, you will recall, ran away after being tortured without mercy. Next, he had a run-in with a gaggle of geese and was almost killed by hunters. He was chased from barnyard and from a farmer's home and finally exhausted. He shivered at the edge of the lake. There is no woman among us who does not know this feeling. And yet, it is just this longing that leads us to hang on, to go on, to proceed with hope. Here is a promise for the wild psyche to all of us. Even though we have only heard about, glimpsed or dreamt a wondrous wild world that we belong to once, even though we have not yet or only momentarily touched it, even though we do not identify ourselves as part of it, the memory of it is a beacon that guides us towards what we belong to, what we belong to, and for the rest of our lives. In the ugly duckling, a knowing yearning stirs when he sees the swans lift up into the sky, and from that single event, his remembrance of that vision sustains him. I worked with a woman who was near the last straw and thinking suicide. A spider making its web on her porch caught her eye. Precisely what it was in that wee beastie's act that chopped the ice around her soul so she could go free and grow again, we will never know. But I am convinced, both as psychoanalyst and as cantadora, that many times it is the things of nature that are the most healing, especially the very accessible and the very simple ones. The medicines of nature are powerful and straightforward. A ladybug on the green rind of a watermelon, a robin with a string of yarn, a weed in a perfect flower, a shooting star, even a rainbow in a glass shard in the street can be the right medicine. Continuance is a strange thing. It puts out tremendous energy. It can be fed for a month on five minutes, contemplating quiet water. It is interesting to note that among wolves, no matter how sick, no matter how cornered, no matter how alone, afraid or weakened, the wolf will continue. She will lope even with a broken leg. She will go near others, seeking the protection of the pack. She will strenuously outwait, outwit, outrun and outlast whatever is bedeviling her. She will put all into taking breath after breath. She will drag herself if necessary, just like the duckling from place to place, till she finds a good place, a healing place, a place for thriving. The hallmark of the wild nature is that it goes on. It perseveres. This is something we do. It is something we are, naturally and innately. When we cannot thrive, we go on till we can thrive again. Whether it be our creative life that we are cut away from, whether it be a culture or a religion we are cast out of, whether it be a familial exiling, a banishment by a group, or sanctions on our movements, thoughts, and feelings, the inner wild life continues and we go on. The wild nature is not native to any particular ethnic group. It is the core nature of women from Benin, Cameroon, and New Guinea. It is the woman from Latvia, the Netherlands, and Sierra Leone. It is the center of Guatemalan women, Haitian women, Polynesian women. Name a country, name a race, name a religion, name a tribe, name a city, a village, a lone outpost. The women all have this in common. The wild woman, the wild soul, they all go on feeling for and following the wild. So if women must, they will paint blue sky on jail walls. If the skies are burnt, they will spin more. If the harvest is destroyed, they will sow more immediately. Women will draw doors where there are none and open them and pass through into new ways and new lives because the wild nature persists and prevails. Women, women persist and prevail. The duckling is led to within an inch of his life. He has felt lonely, cold, frozen, harassed, chased, shot at, given up on, unnourished, out there, way out of bounds, at the edge of life and death, and not knowing what will come next. And now comes the most important part of the story. Spring approaches, new life quickens, a new turn, a new try is possible. The most important thing is to hold on, hold out for your creative life, for your solitude, for your time to be and do, for your very life. Hold on. The promise from the wild nature is this. After winter, spring always comes. Love for the soul. Hold out, hold on. Do your work. You will find your way. 
At the end of the tale, the swans recognize the duckling as one of their own, before he does. It is rather typical of the exiled woman. After all that hard wandering, they manage to wander over the frontier into home territory, and often don't realize for a time that people's looks have ceased to be disparaging, and are often more neutral, when they are not admiring and approving. One would think that now, that they are on their own psychic ground, they would be deliriously happy, but no. For a time at least, they are terribly distrustful. Do these people really regard me? Am I really safe here? Will I be chased away? Can I really sleep with both eyes closed now? Is it all right to act like a swan? After a time, these suspicions fall away, and the next stage of coming back to oneself begins, acceptance of one's own unique beauty, that is, the wild soul from which we are made. There's probably no better or more reliable measure of whether a woman has spent time in ugly duckling status at some point or all throughout her life than her inability to digest a sincere compliment. Although it could be a matter of modesty, it could be attributed to shyness, although too many serious wounds are carelessly written off as nothing but shyness. More often a compliment is stuttered around uh, about because it sets up an automatic and unpleasant dialogue in the woman's mind. If you say how lovely she is, or how beautiful her art is, or compliment anything else her soul took part in, inspired or suffused, something in her mind says she is undeserving, and do the compliment are an idiot for thinking such a thing to begin with. Rather than understand that the beauty of her soul shines through when she is being herself, the woman changes the subject and effectively snatches nourishment away from the soul self, which thrives on being acknowledged and on being seen. So that is the final work of the exile who finds her own. To not only accept one's own individuality, one specific identity as a certain kind of person, but also to, ac also to accept one's beauty. The shape of one's soul and the fact that living close to that wild creature transforms us and all that it touches. When we accept our own wild beauty, it is put into perspective, and we are no longer poignantly aware of it any more. But neither would we forsake it or disclaim it either. Does a wolf know how beautiful she is when she leaps? Does a feline know what beautiful shapes she makes when she sits? Is a bird awed by the sound it hears when it snaps open its wings? Learning from them, we just act in our own true way, and do not draw back from or hide our natural beauty. Like the creatures, we just are, and it is right. For women, the searching and finding is based on the mysterious passion that women have for what is wild, what is innately themselves. We've been calling the object of this yearning wild woman. But even when women do not know her by name, even when they do not know where she resides, they strain towards her, they love her with all their hearts, they long for her, and that longing is both motivation and locomotion. It is the yearning that causes us to search for the wild woman and find her. It is not as hard as one might first imagine. The wild woman is searching for us too. We are her young. The Mistaken Zygote Over the years of my practice it became clear that this issue of belonging sometimes needs to be hailed from a lighter side, for levity can shake some of the pain out of a woman. I began to tell my clients a story I created called The Mistaken Zygote mainly as a way to help them look at their outer, outsider material with a more empowering metaphor. This is how the story goes. Have you ever wondered how you managed to end up in such an odd family as yours? If you have lived your life as an outsider, as a slightly odd or different person, if you're a loner, one who lives at the edge of the mainstream, you've suffered. Yet there also comes a time to row away from all that, to experience a different vantage point, to immigrate back to the land of one's own kind. Let there be no more suffering, no more attempting to figure where you went wrong. The mystery of why you were born to whomever you were born is over. Finis, terminado, finished. Rest for a moment at the bar and refresh yourself in the wind coming from your homeland. For years, women who carry the mythic life of the wild woman archetype have silently cried, Why am I so different? Why was I born into such a strange or unresponsive family? Wherever their lives wanted to burst forth, someone was there to salt the ground so nothing could grow. They felt tortured by all the prescriptions against their natural desires. If they were nature children, they were kept under roofs. If they were scientists, they were told to be mothers. If they wanted to be mothers, they were told they'd better fit the mold entirely. If they wanted to invent something, they were told to be practical. If they wanted to create, they were told a woman's domestic work is never done. 
Sometimes they tried to be good according to whichever standards were most popular and didn't realize till later that they, what they really wanted and how they, they needed to live. Then in order to have a life, they experienced the painful amputations of leaving their families, the marriages they had promised under oath would be till death, the jobs that were to be the springboards to something more stultifying but better paying. They left dreams scattered all over the road. Often the women were artists who were trying to be sensible by spending 80% of their time doing labor that aborted their creative lives only on a, on a daily basis. Although the scenarios are endless, one thing remains constant. They were pointed out very early on as different, with a negative commentation. In actual fact, they were passionate individual inquiring and in their right instinctive minds. The answer to why me, why this family, why am I so different, is of course that there are no answers to these questions. Still, the ego needs something to chew on before it will let go. So I propose three answers regardless. The analysant may pick up whichever one she likes, but she must pick up at least one. Most pick the last one, that any are sufficient. Prepare yourself. Here they are. We are born the way we are, and into the odd families we come through. One. Just because almost no one will believe this. Two. The self has a plan and our pea brains are too tiny to pass it. Many find this a hopeful idea. Or three, because of the mistaken Zygo syndrome. Well, yes, maybe. But what is that? Your family thinks you're an alien. You have feathers. They have scales. Your idea of good time is the forest, the wild, the inner life, the outer majesty. Their idea of a good time is folding towels. If this is for you in your family, then you are a victim of the mistaken Zygo syndrome. Your family moves slowly through time, you move like the wind, they are loud, you're soft, or they are silent and you sing. You know because you just know, they want proof and a 300 page dissertation. Sure enough, it's the mistaken zygote syndrome. You've never heard of that? Well, see, the zygote fairy was flying over your home time one night and all the little zygotes in her basket were hopping and jumping with excitement. You were indeed destined for parents who would have understood you, but the zygote fairy hit turbulence, and oops, you fell out of the, ba the basket, over the wrong house. You fell head over heels, head over heels, right into a family that was not meant for you. Your real family was three miles further on. That is why you fell in love with a family that wasn't yours, and that lived three miles over. You always wished Mrs. and Mr. So-and-so would be your real parents. Chances are they were meant to be. This is why you tap dance down the hallways, even though you come from a family of television spores. This is why your parents are alarmed every time you come home or call. They worry, well, what will she do next? She embarrassed us last time. God only knows what she'll do now. Aye. They cover their eyes, and when they see you coming, it is not because your light dazzles them. All you want is love. All they want is peace. The members of your family, for their own reasons, because of their preferences, innocence, injury, constitution, mental illness, or cultivated ignorance, are not so good at being spontaneous with the unconscious. And of course, your visit home conjures a trickster archetype, the one who stirs things up. So before you've even broken bread together, the trickster madly dances by, just dying to drop one of her hairs into the family's stew. Even though you don't mean to upset the family, they will be upset no matter what. When you show up, everyone and everything seems to be to go quite mad. It is her sign of wild zygotes in the family. If the parents are offended all the time and children feel as though they can never do anything right, the unwild family wants only one thing, but the mistaken zygote is never able to figure out what that is. And if she could, it would make her hair stand up in exclamation points. Prepare yourself. I will tell you this big secret. This is what they really want from you, that mysterious, momentous thing. The unwild want consistency. They want you to be exactly the same today as you were yesterday. They wish you not to change with the days, but to remain as at the beginning of steaming time. Ask the family if they want consistency, and they will answer affirmatively. In all things, no, they will say. Only in the things that matter. Whatever these things are that count in their value systems, they are too often anathema to the wild nature of women. Unfortunately, the things that matter to them are not cohesive with the things that matter to the wild child. Consistency in manner is an impossible sentence for wild women, for her strength is her adaptation to change, her innovation, her dancing, her howling, her growling, 
her deep instinctual life, her creative fire. She does not show consistency through uniformity, but rather through creative life, through her consistent perceptions, quick-sightedness, flexibility, and deftness. If we were to name only one thing that makes the wild woman what she is, it would be her responsiveness. The word response comes from the Latin to pledge, to promise, and that is her strong suit. Her perceptive and deft responses are a consistent promise and pledge to the creative forces, be it duende, the goblin spirit, behind passion or beauty, art or the dance or life. Her promise is her promise to us, if we will not thwart it, is that she will cause us to live. She will cause us to live fully alive, responsively and consistently so. In this way, the mistaken zygote gives her fealty not to her family, but to her interior self. This is why she feels torn. You might say her wolf mother has told her, has hold of her tail. Her worldly family has hold of her arms. It is not long before she's crying in pain, snarling and biting herself and others. And finally, the deathly quiet. You look in her eyes and you see ojos del cielo, sky eyes. The eyes of a person who is no longer there. While socialization for children is an important thing, to kill the interior creatura is to kill the child. The West Africans recognize that to be harsh. The child is to cause its soul to retreat from its body, sometimes just a few feet away, other times many, many days walk away. While the, while the needs of the child's soul must be balanced with her need for safety and physical care, and with carefully examined notions about civilized behavior, I always worry for those who are too well behaved. They often have what they often have that faint soul look in their eyes. Something is not right. A healthy soul shines through the persona on most days and blazes through on others. Where there is gross injury, the soul flees. Sometimes it drifts or bolts so far away that it takes masterful propitiation to coax it back. A long time has passed before such a soul will trust enough to return. But it can be accomplished. The tree will require several ingredients, naked honesty, stamina, tenderness, sweetness, ventilation of rage, and humor. Combined, these make a song that calls the soul back home. What are soul needs? They lie in two realms, nature and creativity. In these realms lives Nashajiji Asadza, spider woman, the great creation spirit of the Diné. She gives her people with protection. Her purview, among others, is teaching the love of beauty. The soul's needs are found in the hovel of those three old or young, depending on what day it is, sisters, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, who make the red thread, meaning the passion of a woman's life. They weave the ages of a woman's life, tying them off as each is completed and the next is begun. They are found in the woods of the huntress spirits Diana and Artemis, both of whom are wolf women and who represent the ability to hunt, track and recover various access aspects of the psyche. The soul's needs are governed by Kotliku, the Aztec goddess of female self-sufficiency, who gives birth squatting and square on her feet. She teaches about the lone woman's life. She is a maker of babies, meaning new potential for life. But she is also a deaf mother who wears skulls on her skirt, and when she walks, they sound like rattles or a snake. For they are skull rattles, and because skull rattles sound also like rain, through sympathetic resonance, they draw down rain for the earth. She is the protectress of all lone women, and no so magia. So filled with powerful thoughts and ideas, they must live out at the edge of who knows where, in order not to daze the village too much. Koetliku is a special protectress of the female outsider. What is the basic nutrition for the soul? Well, it differs from creature to creature, but here are some combinations. Consider them psychic macrobiotics. For some women, air, night, sunlight, and trees are necessities. For others, words, paper, and books are the only things that satiate. For others, color, form, shadow, and clay are the absolutes. Some must leap, bow, and run, for their souls crave dance. Crave dance. Yet others crave only a tree-leaning space. There is yet another issue to be dealt with. Mistaken zygotes learn to be survivors. It is not tough to spend years among those who cannot help you to flourish. Being able to say that one is a survivor is an accomplishment. For many, the power is in the name itself, and yet comes at a time in the individuation process when the threat 
or trauma is significantly past. Then is the time to go to the next stage after survivorship to healing and to thriving. If we stay survivors only without moving to thriving, we limit ourselves and cut our energy to ourselves and our power in the world to less than half. One can take so much pride in being a survivor that it becomes a hazard to further creative development. Sometimes people are afraid to continue beyond survivor status for it is just that, a status, a distinguishing mark, a damn straight, bet your buttons, better believe it, accomplishment. Instead of making survivorship the centerpiece of one's life, it is better to use it as one of many badges, not the only one. Humans deserve to be dripping in beautiful remembrances, medals and decorations for having lived, truly lived and triumphed. Once the threat is past, there is potential trap in calling ourselves by names taken on during the most terrible times of our lives. It creates a mindset that is potentially limiting. It's not good to base the soul identity solely on the feats and losses and victories of the bad times. While survivorship can make a woman tough as beef jerky at some point, allying with it exclusively begins to inhibit new development. When a woman insists, I am a survivor, over and over again, once the time for its usefulness is past, the work ahead is clear. We must loosen the person's clutch on the survivor archetype. Otherwise, nothing else can grow. I liken it to a tough little plant that managed without water, sunlight, nutrients to send out a brave and ordinary little leaf anyway, in spite of it all. But thriving means now that the bad times are behind to put ourselves into occasions of the lush, the nutritive, the light, and there to flourish, to thrive with bushy, shaggy, heavy blossoms and leaves. It is better to name ourselves names that challenge us to grow as free creatures. This is thriving. That is what is meant for us. Ritual is one of the ways in which humans put their lives in perspective, whether it be Purim, Advent, or drawing down the moon. Ritual calls together the shades and spectres in people's lives, sorts them out, puts them to rest. There's a particular image from El Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, celebrations that can be applied to help women in the transition from surviving to thriving. It is based on the rite of ofrendas, which are altars to those who have passed from this life. Ofrendas are tributes, memorials, and expressions of deepest regard for the loved ones no longer on the earth. I find it helps many women to make an ofrenda to the child they once were, rather like a testament to the heroic child. Some women choose objects, writings, clothing, toys, mementos from events, and other symbols from childhood that will be portrayed. They arrange your flender in their own way, tell the story that goes on with it or not, and then leave it up for as long as they wish. It is the evidence of their past hardship, valor, and triumph of adversity. This way of looking at the past accomplishes several things. It gives perspective, a compassionate rendering of times past, by laying out what one experienced and what has made of it, what is admirable. It is the admiring of it rather than the being of it that releases the person. To be the child survivor beyond its time is too over-identified with an injured archetype. To realize the injury and yet memorialize it allows striving to come forth. Thriving is what is meant for us on this earth. Thriving, not just surviving, is our birthright as women. Do not cringe and make yourself small if you are called the black sheep, the maverick, the lone wolf. Those with slow seeing say a nonconformist is a blight on society, but it has been proven over the centuries that being different means standing at the edge, means one is practically guaranteed to make an original contribution, a useful and stunning contribution to her culture. When seeking guidance, don't ever listen to the tiny-hearted. Be kind to them, heap them with blessing, cajole them, but do not follow their advice. If you've ever been called defiant, incorrigible, forward, cunning, insurgent, unruly, rebellious, you're on the right track. Wild woman is close by. If you've never been called these things, there is yet time. Practice your wild woman. Andele. And again.